So this show got me thinking about my father. As some of you know, my father was, for a while, a reasonably successful Broadway playwright. And then when he kind of hit a wall with that, he started selling houses, started showing real estate. Uh, and so as a real estate agent, and this is sort of during the 60s and 70s, and you know they didn't have those cute little combination lock boxes that they have now where the keys are. So, you know, he'd show up at houses with some customers, some clients, and I don't know, sometimes I think maybe the door would be locked or the key wasn't where it was supposed to be or whatever. And, and you know, I think people improvise in those situations. And so, I don't know, maybe sometime in the 80s, my father tried his hand at writing novels. He wrote a couple of novels that weren't published, and I would read them to edit them. And the second one was notable because of how much information there was in there about how to break into houses. Like, he really knew a lot about how to break into houses. One of the characters knew so much about locks and how they worked. And you could kind of tell he wasn't faking it. And I suddenly realized that my father, who thought a lot about committing crimes anyway, that's another story, but he didn't commit crimes, but he thought a lot about them, that my father, just by being a real estate agent, by going to houses and maybe occasionally having to get into a house that wasn't left the way that it was supposed to, you know, he just knew a lot about this and he knew the names of locks and how different ones worked and all kinds of stuff like that. And that's he's kind of the perfect beginning for this show because it's very much about the environment that we live in, the environment that we are very accustomed to and the environment that we think about as essentially a benign environment. It's where we live. It's where we work. You know, it's where we walk in when we're supposed to walk in and and other people are kept out when they're supposed to be kept out. We don't even think too much about that. But if you're a hammer, everything does look like a nail. And if you're a burglar, everything looks like a door and or at least a space that you could get through. And so the world that we think about is very different from the world the burglar thinks about. A burglar winds up knowing a lot of stuff. And burglars also wind up, it turns out, talking to a lot of people like my father or maybe like the people my father talked to. Because there's a tremendous amount of latent information out there um, that wasn't necessarily designed to be used by criminals. But it's very usable by criminals. So that's very much what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking to uh, Jeff Maino. He's the author of A Burglar's Guide to the City, um, which is kind of all about that. It was recently picked up by CBS Studios to produce a pilot, too. Um, He writes a blog. We'll tell you about that. Um, But the first thing, I I guess I've already told you the first thing. The second thing I'm going to say before we get to Jeff is that I think there's also this sense that inside a lot of us, is that burglar, right? That, you know, I mean, maybe you don't actually intend to commit any crimes, but there's maybe you maybe you have more potential to be a burglar. Maybe you don't have to be this arch fiend. In fact, most of the people in Jeff's book don't come across as arch fiends. They tend to be rather mild-mannered people who have almost a scholarly bent, a scholarly interest uh, in certain things. Uh, and it made me think uh, of the way that uh, Tolkien begins his novel, The Hobbit. Uh, We'll hear a little bit from the film version here, because as you recall, what happens is Gandalf and his dwarves show up at the house of this incredibly mild-mannered, guileless, and innocent hobbit named Bilbo Baggins, who's never done anything daring or criminal in his life. But Gandalf has represented to the dwarves that he has the perfect burglar. I've never stolen a thing in my life. I'm afraid I have to agree with Mr. Baggins. He's hardly burglar material. Aye, the wild is no place for gentle folk who can neither fight nor fend for themselves. He is. Hobbits are remarkably light on their feet. In fact, they can pass unseen by most if they choose. And while the dragon is accustomed to the smell of dwarf, the scent of a hobbit is all but unknown to him, which gives us a distinct advantage. You asked me to find the 14th member of this company, and I have chosen Mr. Baggins. There's a lot more to him than appearances suggest, and he's got a great deal more to offer than any of you know, including himself. 
All right. So, Jeff Mayno, uh, burglars uh, exist all through literature. They probably have existed for as long as there has been an enclosed space in which somebody else kept his or her property. There were probably Neolithic burglars who would go inside your cave and take your stuff while you were away. And we know and you know from uh, like like me, you apparently took a bunch of Latin uh, at some point. So we know uh, that even in the Golden Ass, the Apuleius uh, comedy, we, we see burglars. Right. Uh, we do. Yeah. And it's, it is a very consistent theme that the minute you have a building or an architectural space, even a cave, as, as you were joking with the Neolithic, um, you've got someone who will try to enter that space through illicit means. And so burglary does go hand in hand with the built environment. And, and we see throughout the ancient world evidence that there were uh, efforts to defeat burglars. Right. There's padlocks and keys and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we do. Um, that's one of the things that's really interesting about kind of going down the rabbit hole of security studies and the sort of anthropology of fortification is that you really do find this deep history of padlocks going all the way back to ancient Egyptian times uh, where you've got, you know, they're made out of wood and they're very beautifully carpentered pieces that interlock with one another, kind of like a puzzle. And you can really see from studying those early uh, mechanisms what the intellectual appeal is of lockpicking and, and for that matter, of, of, of the burglar who seeks to get through a door by, by crack, you know, picking a lock or cracking a safe, that it really feels as if you're solving a puzzle, that someone has set a kind of technical challenge, that you have figured out the thing that they have built, and that you, have, you can show a, a different, even a better, a faster way of um, un- unlocking the, the mechanism or, or getting through that challenge. So it's a pretty interesting um, thing to trace back that far. You know, it does go back, as you mentioned, thousands of years. It's not a modern uh, phenomenon. So one of the points that you make in your book is that burglars um, are often quite brilliant and studious. Sometimes they're a real combination of brilliant and stupid. Uh, but, but more frequently, if successful burglars anyway, are people who have a tremendous amount of talent and, and a tremendous amount of aptitude uh, and an interest in architecture and the built environment. They just happen to have turned that interest uh, towards an area that's uh, regarded unfavorably by the law. One of the people that you wound up uh, in touch with while doing your book is a guy named, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how you say his na- last name, Jack Daxwin. Is that how you say it? Tell us about Jack. Um, yeah, Jack Daxwin uh, was definitely one of the most interesting people I encountered while writing the book. So Jack Daxwin actually has a pseudonym. Uh, he spoke to me under an assumed name because he currently works in the security industry. And according to him, at least his current employer is not aware of his background as a burglar. Uh, so he wanted to keep his identity secret. But what was really interesting about uh, his approach to the field, I guess you could say, was that he had an unbelievably uh, uh, intense uh, attention to detail. So one of the things that really stood out in how he explained how he would, you know, choose the buildings that he broke into, um, he's based in Toronto, and he had basically memorized the city's fire code, and he used the city's fire code as a kind of targeting mechanism. So he was able to determine without ever setting foot inside of a building, just looking at the outside where the emergency exits might be, if there was an exterior fire escape, um, judging from the age of the building itself, he'd be able to uh, determine what in fire code would be uh, set for the interior. So he would know maybe how many apartments were on each floor. He would know how far the entrances to each apartment were from the emergency stairs because that was regulated by the fire uh, code. And what I think is so interesting about this is that, um, you know, this this totally abstract piece of city uh, uh, legislation, as it were, is sort of hiding in plain sight. You know, we've all heard of fire code. It's there to protect us. It's there to make sure we don't get trapped inside a building if there's an inferno. But the notion that somebody could come along and look at that exact same thing and turn that into this kind of um, secret code of, of burglary and use that to choose his next building or to figure out how to get in and out of a, of a particular structure in the city, um, I think is a really great example, actually, of the kind of creativity and the cleverness that can really be at the heart of this crime and, and, to, and how it looks at uh, architecture itself, how it looks at the city. It's a really interesting way of uh, taking the details that you and I might take for granted and turning those into effectively kind of accomplices in crime. Um, the uh, Another point, I think it was Jack who, who made the point that the Internet was sort of a godsend to the burglary world. Not that they couldn't do it without the Internet, but suddenly everything, all kinds of information that they needed was put within just sort of a mouse click uh, of their hands. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning uh, when you were discussing your father. Uh, 
you know, he uh, Jack Daxon had pointed out that, you know, one of the things that he began to use most effectively was all of the online real estate information that, that is out there now. Um, you know, um, uh, you can even find it, I'm sure, for your own uh, home or apartment. It's certainly true for my uh, and my wife's apartment in Brooklyn, where if you look up our address and the apartment number, one of the first things that comes up on a Google search is uh, when the apartment was last sold. Uh, you can get blue, not, not blueprints, but you can get the actual floor plan from the real estate office. You can get interior photographs that were taken when the building was first for sale. And you can learn an awful lot about uh, everything from what lock was on the front door at one point to where that front door might be to where the electrical box is or if there is a terrace, how you might be able to climb onto that terrace. And that's all just through the most uh, rudimentary Google search. Um, so, you know, that, what Jack Daxon was pointing out was that actually in this age of kind of real estate transparency where we're all going on Zillow or we go to Curbed for that matter or we're looking up uh, maybe an apartment we want to move into next, um, all of that information can be uh, kind of flipped around and used as a weapon to, to get into those same buildings. Um, he also pointed out, though, interestingly, that it does. it's not only as superficial as that. It's not just a, a quick Google search. Um, if you actually get access to some of the more advanced, I guess you could say, um, architectural records, um, you can even find out not only just the, the, the actual blueprints that were used in the construction of a building, um, but you can find out what materials were used. So if you need to get from one office to the next, you'll know whether or not it's a cinder block wall or maybe brick or maybe just drywall, and you can carve right through it. Um, and he would use that to determine everything from how loud it might be if he had to carve through a wall in case uh, the security teams might overhear him. Uh, to what kind of tools he would need to bring to the job. And so all of that is, you know, it's architectural information. It's the kind of thing that if you are an engineering student, you might geek out over, you know, trying to figure out how the Empire State Building was built or how an old bank was was put together. But if you're somebody like Jack Daxman, you can take that information and really understand the built environment from the inside out and then use that data to uh, effectively plan a better attack. Yeah, I mean, that kind of information is fascinating. And, and I think... Uh, at one point, maybe at the beginning of your book, you talk about, like, I think, wasn't there one guy who just would just go through, through drywall after drywall after drywall? Like, he'd hit a, a bunch of row condos without ever having to step back outside. You know, he could do, go to three or four of them just by going through the drywall. Yeah, I, I love that example, actually. It was a, a gentleman in suburban Maryland, and uh, he had been arrested after, as you mentioned, just tunneling through uh, townhouse after townhouse. And so he would basically just break into one and then go through the walls into the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, um, you know, which is quite interesting, especially, you know, even in Brooklyn where I live, um, you know, we have very thin walls uh, mm-hmm. between us and the apartment next door. Uh, and, you know, our, our newest neighbors who moved in with a piano, uh, I maybe don't quite realize that. But in any case, um, you know, getting into their apartment through the wall would be astonishingly easy because it's very obvious that there are no true structural members in the, in the wall itself. Um, but uh, also one detail I just loved about that individual in, in Maryland was that when he was finally arrested, uh, when the police patted him down, he had a whole bunch of other people's um, TV remote controls <laughs> stuffed in the pockets of his sweatpants, uh, which I just think is a funny uh, example of the, the uh, kind of the absurdities of, of what people will actually steal when they go into someone else's home. Right. We'll swing back to that in a second, too, because I do want to talk about the fact that as brilliant as these people are, they're often also there's a current of stupidity that runs through some of them. Um, but I want to stay with Brilliant for a second. One of the other people that you profile is a guy named Bill Mason. is a master jewel thief. Um, and, and, you know, he's a nice example, I think, of what you're talking about very specifically, which is you think about somebody who's a jewel th- thief, you think, well, he must be really interested in jewels. He must really like jewels. He must, you know, but with Bill Mason, you don't get that idea so much. You get the idea of what really draws Bill Mason is buildings to get into. Yeah, exactly. Bill was really interesting in terms of how he explained the motivation that led him to become a burglar. Um, You know, as you mentioned, it wasn't that he was, uh, you know, uh, obsessed with jewelry or had some sort of, you know, geological uh, uh, fetish that he wanted to accumulate as many diamonds as possible. It was actually that, according to him, you know, he was raised by building superintendents. Um, You know, his parents, I guess, were pretty absent. uh, And so looking for someone to hang out with, spend time with and kind of mentor under Rather than a father figure, he had building superintendents that would show him around um, the emergency stairs, the maintenance corridors, the janitorial closets, the basements and subcellars that people don't normally get into, the steam rooms, and even the roofs. 
And so according to Bill, at least, that gave him a kind of um, almost like a fluency in the language of architecture so that he understood how buildings were internally configured. And he also gained a kind of confidence, I guess you could say, or a comfort with actually going into those spaces. You know, speaking from personal experience, it can often be, um, you know, psychologically prohibitive, so to speak, to open up that door that says do not enter or to go into a room of a uh, a hotel or an office complex or even my own apartment building, um, knowing that I don't have permission to go into that. But for Bill, that wasn't really an issue. You know, he understood that um, th- these spaces in the book, I refer to them as the dark matter of architecture. Um, they they exist. They connect rooms and buildings in ways that uh, residents tend to overlook. And if you want to put that space to use, if you want to put these subsidiary, invisible background spaces to, to use as a burglar, uh, then a knowledge of architecture is really key to that. And so that was something that I thought was, um, you know, uh, as far as an insight into how architecture operates, um, it was something that, again, was just kind of hiding in plain sight. You know, how many times have you seen a fire escape door that you haven't opened or you've walked past a stairwell in your own building that you've never gone down? Um, or, you know, you might be aware that there is a steam cellar in your own apartment building or a place of work. But have you ever seen it? Have you ever gone down there? Um, and the fact that those spaces are out there just sort of waiting to be put to use is something that is really uh, was really interesting to me from an architectural point of view. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's uh, first of all, I love that point. It was the thing that got me thinking about my father was when Bill was saying that super superintendents, the super, you know, or, or maintenance people often know more about how a building really works than maybe even the architect uh, who designed it in the first place, just because they're living with the reality of it, not on paper, but in the physical world all the time. They have all this information. And then you have a guy like him who, you know, you and I might be walking a past a building and go, well, that, look at all the detail. You know, look at all that lovely detail. Look at the architectural, you know, look at the, you know, and we may have ways to describe that, the style and the detail. What Bill sees is a very thin ledge, you know, that, that connects two balconies that really connects all the balconies in an apartment building on any one floor. A ledge that looks precipitously thin, maybe not the kind of thing that you and I would think of hooking our toes over so we could get from balcony to balcony. But to him, that's the architecture, right? It's an invitation. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that shows that there really is a totally different way of looking at architecture if you are treating it as an obstacle or as a challenge to overcome. So if the building in front of you is a puzzle and you're going to solve that puzzle, you're going to lock onto or seek out or kind of uh, focus on certain details that, yeah, exactly, people like you and I are, are otherwise going to overlook. Or we might see it and think, wow, that's some really beautiful 19th century ornament. But we don't realize that, in fact, it's also a great handhold. It's how we're going to get up to the second floor or how we could get up to the third floor. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Bill Mason would actually – uh, often, according to him at least, sit outside of these high-rise buildings in places like Miami and Fort Lauderdale, and it would it would look for all the world like he was just suntanning or maybe you know um, watching people walk by on the beach. But in reality, you know, with his sunglasses on, what he was really looking at were those buildings uh, behind everybody, and he was trying to figure out the patterns of occupancy. So whether or not somebody would be home on certain evenings, who were the socialites, who tended to have people over. And once that combination was right, once he realized that the the, the right uh, sequence of apartments was uninhabited and he would be able to get into the place that he was actually targeting, um, you know, I, I compare it to somebody who is uh, strategizing how to beat the next level in Donkey Kong. You know, he's, uh, he's trying to figure out how to get from one ledge to the next and work his way up to the top of the building. Um, once he was able to do that, that was when he would actually attack or, you know, when he would actually commit the burglary. Um, just very briefly, I think it's really funny that um, one of the people that he broke into um, the apartment of his, <laughs> was Johnny Weissmuller. He was the actor, actually, who, of all people, played Tarzan. Uh, and so there's a sort of a strange, uh, perhaps even deliberate karma in the fact that uh, Bill Mason came swinging on, you know, from balcony to balcony, only to rob the individual who played Tarzan in the in the in the movies, um, you know, there's a kind of architectural sense of humor there, perhaps. Yeah, and you get the feeling that was not lost on Bill. Um, yeah. So, um, okay, now we need to pull back a little bit. We've been talking about a build, uh, burglar looking at a building, but burglars don't always look just at buildings. Sometimes they have to pull the lens back even further and look at the infrastructure that surrounds the buildings. And that gives us a chance to talk about a group of people who, who not only did this, but in some ways they're the best kinds of burglars at all, the people you can't talk to because nobody ever caught them. Nobody knows who they are. Uh, so tell us, uh, I mean, this could be a two-hour conversation, but give us the short version of the hole in the ground gang. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, really interesting story. As you mentioned, they were never caught. Uh, so it's actually still an unsolved crime. Um, no one aside from the group um, knows who the hole in the ground gang really were. 
um, what they were in the short version was a group of bank robbers in mid-1980s Los Angeles. Uh, in June of 1986, they targeted a bank that was on Sunset Boulevard, uh, basically r- right out of the Hollywood Hills so that it was only a couple blocks from Nichols Canyon and that kind of thing. So right where the roads kind of come out of the seclusion of the Hollywood Canyons, you would get to where this bank was located. Um, the other thing that that meant, though, was that water would come draining out of the hills and would go into the city at these points. And that's where the Department of Water and Power had built its storm sewer network. So there were these catchment basins and then leading into tunnels. And then those tunnels led into the greater sort of labyrinth of Los Angeles that disappeared under the city and eventually went out to sea. So that might just sound like a you know an infrastructural insight, but these guys took advantage of that and they used that as their method of entry. And so they actually used Suzuki four-wheelers uh, that were actually no wider, really, than the tunnels themselves. So they had to hunch over on these things, almost like, you know, jockeys at uh, the Kentucky Derby. Um, And they would go down um, underground beneath Los Angeles, and they found a place to sort of camp out. And once they were there, they started tunneling. Um, In fact, one of the theories that the FBI had, and uh, I was able to speak to the uh, FBI special agent, a man named William Rader, uh, who was in charge of investigating this crime, Um, One of the theories that they had at the time was actually that these guys were so good at mining that they might actually have come from the mining industry itself. They were that good at using tunneling equipment and and, and doing what they were doing. But also another theory was that they understood the infrastructural workings of Los Angeles so well that maybe they might have come from the Department of Water and Power. So it was a kind of a, you know, inside job from the Water and Power Company uh, who had brought on maybe a, a cousin who knew mining equipment. But so in any case, they hit this bank from below. So they drilled up into it using a concrete corer. And uh, got into the vaults. Uh, they did it over a long three-day weekend, and uh, they were able to um, flee underground with uh, about, I think if I remember correctly, $2.5 million in cash plus everything that they had taken out of the safe deposit boxes. I think it was, um, so v- was $172,000 in cash plus $2.5 uh, of what they took out in the safe deposit boxes. I come from okay, a family sure. of potential thieves. We tend to be very interested uh, in the loot. In the uh, precision. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm not really uh, interested in how they do it. I just want to know how much money I could get if I did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the secret appeal. Right. So um, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, just to make a long story short, so then they came back a year later, actually, and they tried to rob two banks simultaneously, and they did the exact same thing. They tunneled into them from below, uh, but unfortunately they, for them, they were interrupted in the act of doing this. Um, but so their escape route was pretty incredible. So they had their Suzuki four-wheelers all over again, but as the FBI descended on this bank, Um, They fled underground, and their escape route was actually seven miles of underground tunneling that went all the way down to a place called Bayona Creek, uh, which is one of the um, concreted over old stream beds of Los Angeles. But so the notion that you knew the city so well that you could trust a seven-mile escape route underground that you wouldn't hit a gate or the tunnels Mm -hmm. wouldn't be flooded or they wouldn't become too narrow to pass through um, is really pretty astonishing and does lend a a certain air of uh, mystique to the idea that if you know how the city works, you can use the city itself as a kind of burglary tool. You can turn the city itself uh, uh, or the city against itself and use it as a method for robbing banks from below or, you know, navigating from neighborhood to neighborhood invisibly beneath the surface of the city. Yeah, there's just amazing examples of stuff like that, including the fact that uh, in order to get rid of some of the sediment or the stuff that was uh, taken out as they dug upwards, they built these little impromptu dams that would dam up just enough uh, a trickle of water down in those tunnels so that when they broke the, when they were done with their work for the day and they broke the dam, it would wash all the sediment away, probably their footprints too. I mean, there's just a lot of ingenuity there. And you, you know, there's an expression in sports, sometimes you just have to tip your cap to the other guy. This special agent, uh, Raider, who you talked about, in, in your book, he says, you know, the statute of limitations is over. I couldn't arrest these guys anyway. I wish they would show up so I could take them out for a beer. <laughs> Uh, it is, yeah. I mean, that's the the. I, I mean, I think the the funny thing about this conversation, you know, is when you're speaking about burglary, especially in the in this kind of um, context, it sounds as if you know you're uh, enthusiastically advocating the act of breaking into someone else's building, um, but in fact, actually, it's really a question not of morally, uh, you know, supporting the act of burglary, but of technically admiring the ability to undercut architecture or to take a, an entire city and turn it into a tool for bank robbery. Um, you know, no matter how you look at it, that is a pretty ingenious approach. It's very clever. It reveals strategic thinking. Um, it's very long term. And there is something really quite uh, technically uh, impressive about that, you know, regardless or, or rather outside of the, the, the dark moral implications of what we're discussing. 
We're talking to Jeff Mayno. Uh, his book is A Burglar's Guide to the City. We have lots more to talk about. We're going to take a little break here when we come back. We're also going to talk a little bit about how you might be helping burglars or just the way that you live or the place that you live might be super attractive or very unattractive to burglars for reasons that you can't right now fathom. Break down the doors. Be a great burglar searching for more. You don't look, you don't case, you don't do nothing. We point you to a score. When we say it's there, it's there. They're all laid out scores. And they worked up. Alarm system diagrams, blueprints, sometimes a front door key, sometimes the scores are in on it. Everybody's ripping off the insurance company. All right, that's uh, Robert Prosky and James Kahn uh, from the great movie Thief, uh, which is one of the, and we're going to talk in the final segment of the show about just the way in which this whole notion has seeped into our culture. I mean, we just love this stuff, and we're going to talk to uh, Steve Hamilton, who writes novels uh, about people like that. Uh, but right now, we're talking also to Jeff Mano, uh, author of the New York Times bestselling Burglar's Guide to the City. Um, and before we get back to Jeff, I have to uh, tell you one thing, or I'll get yelled at. Uh, so tomorrow at 3 p.m., uh, Richard Dreyfus. I think if he's ever been in a heist movie, I can't think of one. Richard Dreyfus and I are going to be sitting on stage at Theater Works, where right now he is playing the role of Albert Einstein in the play Relativity. Uh, he and I are going to sit there and have a conversation uh, about, among other things, civics, which he's really interested in. Uh, but we'll also talk about movies and stuff like that and sharks. Uh, so uh, the tickets are $20 if you want to come and join our studio audience uh, to benefit WNPR and Theater Works. So you call the Theater Works box office. You can just look that up online, but it's 860-527-7838. We have tickets available, and you'll also get to see how we record a show. We're going to try to turn it into a show, but you'll get to see. And believe me, that is pulse-pounding excitement, watching how we uh, set up microphones and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right, maybe not. Uh, still, it's exciting, right? Uh, all right, we're back to Jeff Mayno. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, Jeff, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what the average person listening to this show, who's not planning to become a burglar, um, can learn about not having burglars hit them. But maybe the, maybe one thing we need to do before that, and I know this is a subject of great interest to you, is talk about what burglary actually means. So burglary is different from robbery. Burglary has a very specific definition. Uh, let's talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, that is actually one of the more interesting things. That, you know, one thing that always came up when I was explaining to people that I was writing a book about burglary uh, was that there was a, you know, a raising of the eyebrows and then a question about why I was really interested in taking things that didn't belong to me or you know, what it was about theft that, that really uh, seemed so interesting. Um, but what I would always point out is that burglary and theft are actually not identical. Um, in fact, you can be a burglar uh, your entire professional career or entire criminal career and never steal anything. So burglary is specifically related to architecture in that it requires you to enter in a defined interior space without permission to be there and with the intention of committing a crime there. Um, and so you can steal things, sure, but you could also, uh, say, fire a gun or you could threaten someone or you could uh, even forge checks, uh, after all, which is a felony. Um, and if you do that within an architectural space you don't have permission to be in, that's burglary. But what that raises, though, is the question of, well, then what is inside? Are we really sure from a legal point of view that we're comfortable knowing where the exterior world ends and the interior world of architecture begins? And that sounds like an incredibly stupid question, actually, because, of course, it's obvious, you know, if you have a door and are, or four walls, then you then you're inside something. But what happens if you've got a screened-in porch, for example, that doesn't have any screens installed, maybe because they blew out in the last storm, or if you've got an awning that goes out over somebody's back patio, or maybe the door was already open. Uh, it was a sliding glass door that was uh, uh, wide open on the back of someone's house, and you and you stepped in. Um, you know, have you have you actually entered a space uh, from uh, that is recognizable in, in a court of law? Um, and so what that's called, though, is called breaking the close. And so that comes from uh, the same word that leads to enclosure or to close a door. And so it's really fascinating in that that leads to these legal arguments about these abstract shapes that would enclose a house or, for that matter, a convertible that's parked on the street um, if it has its top down. Legally speaking, that top is still there. It's an automotive close so that if you reach in and take something out of a convertible that's parked on the street, that's automotive burglary, even if you haven't actually damaged or even touched the car. Um, so these these shapes, though, become argued about by lawyers in order to prove that um, even the smallest part of a 
of a, a, a an accused criminal um, might have entered into a building. And so that leads to really f- bizarre scenarios where one individual, for example, um, was busted for burglary even though he was only leaning on the outside windowsill of someone's house, but his fingertip uh, – passed through where the window would have been if it hadn't been open. And because he was threatening the homeowner, um, that constituted not only an entry, but also a felony, and therefore he was arrested for burglary. Um, so you get into this strange world where you know it's, it's about architecture that isn't there. It's about architecture that is legally visible, but invisible to you and I. Um, and you know that's one of the stranger definitions of burglary and how it directly engages with the very notion that we know what architecture or an interior space is uh, in the first place. And sometimes it's a way for prosecution to kind of upcharge you, too. They're charging you with something else. But if they can add burglary if it fits their statutory definition of it. As you point out, um, Nebraska, for example, has a statutory uh, definition of burglary and what what a clo- enclosure is that includes smokehouses, slaughterhouses, schoolhouses, storehouses, chicken houses, malt houses, meeting houses, barns, mills, potteries, railroad car factories, railroad cars themselves, private telephone pay stations, and public telephone booths. So, I mean, there's sort of a lot of things that can be burglary. So one of the things that you looked at, I mean, we were, t- we were talking about the Hole in the Ground gang and how they got away in this kind of amazing uh, seven-mile uh, exit through the tunnels. But most burglars aren't that smart or aren't that sophisticated, but they do have to know how to get away. I mean, that's sort of the part of this that we haven't talked about. And so, once again, the built environment plays a big role, right? Burglars like things, cities or towns or neighborhoods with grids, and they like uh, uh, the ability to get on a freeway really fast. Um, they do, actually. And, and that goes back to the, the question of infrastructure and uh, understanding how the infrastructure of the city itself, how urban design can actually inadvertently uh, permit or even catalyze certain crimes. Um, so to just stick with Los Angeles for a second, um, there's a really interesting example from L.A., which is known as the Stop and Rob um, which is a little you know, uh, nickname developed by law enforcement for describing uh, a bank or a credit union or really any kind of business that is at the bottom of an off-ramp and at the bottom of an on-ramp for the city's freeways, which means that you can stop, rob, and then just get back on the freeway and disappear. Um, so what I think is interesting about that is that you know when these freeways were implemented in the 1960s, they were seen as you know revolutionizing personal transit in Los Angeles. But what they weren't seen as uh, was a future burglary tool. Um, you know when we make infrastructural decisions, we tend not to be thinking about how criminals might be misusing those same transportation options 20 or even 30 years in the future. But it raises the question of whether or not we are. Uh, sort of hardwiring certain future crimes into the city based on how they're being designed in the present day. Um, You know, other kinds of vulnerabilities also pop out. Um, I was really interested to be able to spend time with the LAPD's Air Support Division, um, which is their helicopter corps. It's the largest municipal helicopter corps in the world, and they basically patrol the city from above. Um, But what they pointed out was that even airspace regulations have an effect on crimes that occur in the city of Los Angeles because when you get near LAX, the airport, Mm -hmm. um, even the police often can't get permission from air traffic control to approach the airport. So if they're following a suspect, it's a really great place to go if that suspect wants to lose the uh, aerial tail. And so they can go into a parking lot near the airport or they can switch cars or they can hide under a bridge. But the helicopters have to hang back. And if a ground unit hasn't gotten there in time, you know, it's a really great way to get away. And so I think that's really fascinating that there are these vulnerabilities actually in the city itself, these kinds of blind spots that the police can't see into. And if you know where those are based on a knowledge of the city's airspace regulations, for example, or where the storm sewers are, um, or even for that matter, you know, where the, how, the highway, how the freeway system operates, um, you can design crimes around those parameters and actually be quite successful at getting away. Uh, I was fascinated to read. We're going to have to take a break here so we can get Steve into the conversation. But I was fascinated to read in your book that um, far from being a disincentive, a lot of burglars uh, are very intrigued by the fact that you have a burglar alarm because it probably means you've got stuff uh, in there that some burglar would actually want. Uh, So, you you know, and they've already figured out, you know, what's wrong with your burglar alarm or where your burglar alarm isn't wired or something like that. Uh, You might be better off getting a really loud dog as opposed to a burglar alarm. Yeah, that's true as well. And also, you know, it comes out anecdotally if if you speak, I'm sure, even to people you know, that if, you know, maybe you ask someone to look out for your house while you're on a vacation – 
um, you know, when the burglar alarm goes off, uh, oftentimes you'll find that people will not respond with any sense of urgency. It just sort of sounds like a car alarm or it can't be something very serious. Uh, and so people tend not to really respond to um, uh, aggressively even to the notion of a burglar alarm. But, yeah, those kinds of things can actually be signals to burglars that, in fact, you're trying to hide something. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why, actually, when you look at the panic room industry, so to speak, um, the, the, uh, the, the construction of ultra-fortified safe rooms inside private homes and businesses, um, oftentimes they will not give you not only a list of clients, but they won't reveal any of the building sites that they've actually worked on because, after all, if people know you have a panic panic room, if they know you've had a safe room uh, uh, established somewhere in your McMansion in the suburbs, that by definition is kind of a clue that there's something that you, and you for some reason, you anticipate someone breaking into your home, you must therefore have something of great value, uh, some personal collection, some amount of cash, some, something in the, in the house. And so those kinds of things actually can be red flags for, for people saying, you know, come here or this is worth breaking into. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, we'll have more of Jeff. We're going to add Steve Hamilton, the author of books like The Lock Artist, fiction about the guys who do this stuff. Today's show was produced by, let's see, I, I put my notes for this right over here. Who took my notes? Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Our intern is Thomas Hewitt Edward Fisher. The part of Bill Curry was played by Robert Logia. Catch up to us on Facebook at the Colin McEnroe Show page and subscribe to us on iTunes. On tomorrow's show, The Secret Lives of Fish. And now... Back to Colin. Yeah, I had to do a shout out to Bob Logia. He was a friend of mine. Uh, but when I met him, I mean, most people thought I was thinking of him as the guy from Scarface or the guy who dances on the piano keys with, with Tom Hanks and Big. Or, to me, he was T H E Cat, Thomas Hewitt Edward Cat from this series that I watched as a TV series. I watched as a kid. It was about a burglar. I just completely loved it. I could never think of Bob in any other way. Uh, all right, we're uh, talking now to Jeff Mayno. Uh, his book uh, is The Burglar's Guide to the City, uh, and which is uh, currently. Uh, being picked up by CBS Studios to produce a pilot. And meanwhile, we're also adding to this conversation uh, Steve Hamilton. Steve Hamilton writes novels about these kinds of people, people who uh, are very good at breaking into places. Uh, he's the uh, Edgar winning, uh, two time Edgar winning author of 13 different crime novels, including, I mentioned, The Lock Artist in 2011. Uh, his uh, most recent book is uh, the New York Times bestselling The Second Life of Nick Mason. Both of these films are also currently in film development. So we've got a lot of entertainment projects going here. So so, um, Steve, I, I was mentioning earlier in the show that obviously uh, people who do this kind of thing, they're criminals. Uh, we think we know what we think about criminals. But the truth is, as a genre, we love this stuff. We love heist novels. We love heist movies. Uh, we root for the guys who are pulling off the heist. Um, what is it about that? What, what's the allure? Why, why do we wind up having a rooting interest in the people who are technically criminals? Well, hi, Colin. Hi. Thanks for having me on. First of all, can, can you hear me? Okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah, we hear you fine. And thanks, Jeff. Too. This, I've been listening to your show so far. I'm just, I've just been um, devouring this because, and I can't wait to read Jeff's book too. And I, I'll, I'll try not to blatantly steal anything from it <laughs> in the next uh, book, but I can't make any promises because this is the stuff that I just love. Um, you know, I, I wrote from the quote-unquote good guy perspective for a lot for a long time, and it was, a, it was a while before I tried writing from the criminal viewpoint, and that's a whole different way of. of Looking at things just like uh, Jeff Jeff has, has been talking about, you well, just see the world in a, in, a, in a different way. In your books, there's you almost get a sense uh, in the Lock Artist, and the Lock Artist is this unusual story of a guy, a young man who's uh, who's unable to speak. He, he right. can't talk, but he can pick locks. And in the descriptions of him picking locks, there's almost an ecstasy, right? There's a yeah. you know a sense of of release or ecstasy of being really good at something. Tell us more about that psychology. Right. It's, it's the ultimate puzzle, and I've and I've always been fascinated by 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 locks and by and by safes, and I and I, I always knew that I would that I would write a book about somebody who had this special talent, and and in order to sort of find out more about it, I had to go find the guys who can actually do this, and that was a whole world of itself, and I and I got to know Dave McGomey, who was the president of a national safe safemen's organization, and he was so generous and so. Um, kind about really sort of 
telling me what it really feels like. As, as a writer, that's what you always want to get to. It's like, you know, there's, there's the nuts and bolts and the details, but I, I, I wanted to know what does it feel like to have that ability and to just sort of touch a lock or, you know, or, or a safe and to know it so well that you can just sort of feel it sort of giving, giving you its secrets, you know. Um, and that's, that's really sort of how, how Dave thinks about a safe. And, and there's such an art to it. And, um, I mean, it was, it was just it was the, one of the greatest things ever just to, just to find out about this and, and to really start doing it myself. I'm never going to be able to break into a safe, but I can pick a pretty good lock now. Well, I love the description of him as what, president of the National Safemen's Association. Yeah, he's, 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 he's a he's safe not cracker. A criminal, by yeah, way. yeah. Let's go, let's be clear about this. He might be the best safe cracker in the world, right? right? And it's and that's one of the first things that he told me is that it's much harder to be a criminal safe cracker <laughs> than to be a legitimate safe cracker because you can't practice. I mean, <laughs> Dave, Dave gets to go to a new safe every day. That's all he does, and he gets to study it and and open up these safes that have you know been broken or combination's been lost or whatever. Um, but a criminal can't just walk into a jewelry store and ask to go practice on the safe in the back. It's, it's not going to go over very well. You know, uh, Jeff Amino, there's a, a parallel that I can think of uh, that's in your book, and I think it's the guy, uh, Jack Daxwin, that we were talking about before. Didn't he wind up working for an alarm company, and he would just take a different alarm system home uh, every few weeks? He did, yeah. That was really interesting. That he took he he kind of went the uh, uh, opposite direction. You know, he went from the the dark side to the good side, as it were. But so he, he used his knowledge of uh, how to break into buildings as a stepping stone for this new career in private security. Um, but yeah, one of the things that he would do was uh, would uh, almost like a lending from a library. He would take alarm systems that were just hitting the market, and he would install them on a house of his outside Toronto, and then figure out ways to defeat the alarm system. So yeah, there was a way to sort of practice in an immersive three D way on on the on the, the or with the tools of the trade. So um, Steve, uh, even though you've studied all this stuff, you're not a master criminal. How do you build the psychological portrait of somebody who is in one of your books? I mean, what do you put into that that psyche? Well, the fir- for the first time I tried this again. You know, this is like I said, this is a real departure from when you're writing about an ex cop or writing about a private eye who's who may do things his own way, but he's sort of doing it for uh, on the right side of law and order to, to sort of switch that around and see things from the other perspective. Really, the first time with, with the lock artist, he's, he's just this young character, and he just has this unforgivable talent, and he sort of gets drawn into this world against his will. Uh, the, the book that came out this year, The Second Life of uh, Nick Mason, which is no relation to Bill Mason, who you guys were talking about earlier, uh, that's where I really had to just sort of go all out and write from the perspective of a professional criminal, mm-hmm. uh, somebody who's this is his job. And, you know, in, in this book, he's, he actually gets out of prison and he has this whole contract that he signs with somebody. He has to answer the phone and go do whatever he's told, uh, no, no matter what it is. So he still has to think like a criminal. Um, and um, it was just a whole different perspective. And, and, and and the thing and the and the challenge as a writer is that you still have to be able to to you know there has to be something in this character that you can that you can identify with and that you can root for uh, because these aren't necessarily monsters or evil people or, or or aliens they're just people who have made this choice in their life and it's the kind of choice that we could all make maybe if if we had to uh, you know. So it was that that was part of the part of the part of the uh, challenge of uh, of writing from from that perspective. You know, Jeff Mayno, there's a, st- a scene in one of uh, Steve Hamilton's books. And it's in The Lock Artist where this young man, I think he's at a sort of big raucous party and they want him to demonstrate that he can do this and he doesn't have any tools with him. And he he manages to get a kind of very simple slender screwdriver. And then because he can't speak, he signals with his hands and eventually people figure out he'd like something like a safety pin, which he then bends at a 45 degree angle and picks this lock in front of a kind of cheering crowd of spectators. But Jeff Mayno, I think one thing you found was, I mean, we think that burglars, you know, need and have have these elaborate kits uh, of specially crafted tools, but the the thing that Steve is describing is not that unusual, right? Burglars can make effective tools out of stuff that's just sort of available to them. Uh, absolutely, uh, and, and that's even you know 
overlooking the fact that often they'll just bypass the door altogether. You know, they'll just kick in the drywall or come in through the window or that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, the tools of breaking and entering are really kind of hidden in plain sight. They're, they're in, um, you know, uh, I took a lockpicking course with a group in Chicago who pointed out that some of the best raw materials for lockpicking equipment actually come from everyday objects like the underwires of women's bras or of street cleaning brushes on trucks that sweep up the gutters every morning in Chicago or even windshield wiper blades. So if you go to the dumpster out back behind a Pet Boys and you take the windshield wiper blades out, you can then bend those into the tensioning tools required for getting into certain types of padlock. And I do think that there's something really interesting about that kind of do-it-yourself, almost Home Depot mentality. Um, you know, a great example of that was actually um, a, a, a very, very, very high-profile break-in in Antwerp, Beldum, excuse me, Belgium, um, where individuals uh, connected actually to an Italian jewelry theft group um, broke into one of the most high-tech vaults in the world, um, and it was a multi-multi-million dollar security system. But one of the ways they got past it was basically by going to the neighborhood hardware store, and they spent about 50 euros on things like a broomstick, a piece of styrofoam, uh, electrical tape, and hairspray, to name just a few. But So they stuck the styrofoam on the end of the broomstick to hide the uh, one of the sensors in the vault. They had, uh, you know, a very high-tech light meter that they had to defeat, so they just stuck electrical tape on it. Uh, and then there was a thermal scanner that would have picked up their body heat, but they just sprayed it with hairspray. Um, you know, so you can imagine the frustration and, and uh, anger of the uh, security team who realized that they've got this thing that is, you know, arguably better than Fort Knox. And these guys, you know, fresh off of a kind of rewards trip to Lowe's come in and rob the place blind. Um, there is something really interesting about that level of ingenuity that you can recognize in the in the objects that surround you uh, every day, the possibility of putting together super tools that will kind of let you get into any vault or any building in the world. It sounds like a superpower, you know, almost like Steve's guy who can hold it just to touch a lock and understand how it operates. Um, and there is something really kind of um, seductive and interesting about that. So, Steve, have you turned into the kind of person that Jeff and I were talking about earlier, the Bill Mason type of person who, as you walk around, are you starting to look at uh, buildings and your built environment and your infrastructure from the point of view of one of your uh, genteel sociopaths? Well, sure, because you're all, you know, when you're working on a book, you're sort of living in that guy's head. And, and, and you do walk around just like any writer does. And, and you see and you see a bank or you, or you see somebody's house and you start thinking like, like your characters, like how would I get into that place? And uh, I know as, as as Jeff can attest, I mean, when when it comes to a safe, I mean, it, so often it'll be built into a wall, say, mm. in in a house. So you have this, you know, this this really well designed safe that's 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 built into a drywall wall, you know. And mm. it, that's if you happen to see something like that, you just can't help thinking. I mean, did, did these people think that somebody couldn't just get into the house, which is probably pretty easy, and then just cut that safe out of, out of the wall and, and drag it out. So um, with the moments that we have left here, and we're kind of running short of time, but Jeff Mayno, you know, I said, I promised everybody at the beginning, we would talk about the fact that some burglars are you know, both brilliant or stupid or just plain stupid, something that you kind of cover at the beginning of the book. You know, there's some guys you just sort of think, what, why are you even doing this? There, wasn't there one guy who would go through the wall of an apartment to get into a restaurant so he could get like desserts, you know, and bottles of sake and stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, the flip side of all this is that, you know, it's easy to romanticize the kind of fantastic cat burglar out of a kind of, you know, Cary Grant fantasy of of, uh, of of the stuff that we're talking about now. But the, the, the other version of that is the, you know, the 95 percent of burglars who really don't know necessarily what they're doing at all. And it's really a spur of the moment kind of thing. But so, yeah, you do find examples like that. There was the individual you mentioned who would steal sake and and, uh, and baked goods after breaking into restaurants and is now serving um, multiple decades in prison for that. Um, there's a, one of my favorite examples of all time, actually, was a guy in Oregon who came up with the brilliant idea that um, natural history museums, of course, uh, have displays <laughs> of rocks and minerals. And these rocks and minerals often include things like gold and silver or even gemstones. And so, well, why, you know, why break into a bank when you can just sneak into a natural history museum? It doesn't have very much security. And so his plan was that in order to disguise himself, he would wear what's known as a ghillie suit. So a ghillie suit is actually what military snipers wear to look like plant life. So they'll, bl they'll blend into a meadow or they'll look like vegetation. So you can hardly imagine a worse costume, in fact, actually to dress up like a plant while moving through a museum of rocks and minerals. And sure enough, uh, he was arrested. Uh, pretty much right away, and uh, his um, 
mugshot is actually one for the ages. He just looks like a very depressed uh, military <laughs> sniper. Um, but the the level of thinking that goes into these crimes can be so you know in, impressive, where somebody actually gets the sk- construction schematics and that kind of thing, or it can be these sort of mind-bogglingly strange decisions uh, that people make that really don't make sense at all, and they get trapped inside uh, air conditioning ducts, or they get lost, or there's uh, actually multiple examples of burglars who can't find their way back out of the building they broke into and actually call 911 for the police to come <laughs> rescue them. Um, so it really is a pretty, uh, it's a glimpse of a different kind of person, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. All right, so, thanks so much to uh, Jeff Mayno, A Burglar's Guide to the City is his book, uh, Steve Hamilton, uh, author of many crime books, including the Lock Artist uh, and uh, what's the new one? The Secret Life of Nick, Second Life of Nick Mason. Thanks especially too to our producer Betsy Kaplan, who none of us will ever trust again as long as we live. She got way too interested in this. Got me inside.